Thank you for being with us today. Welcome to this Climate Action Accelerator webinar. My name is Sonia Schmid. I'm leading the solutions team at the Climate Action Accelerator. And today we're going to be discussing the topic on how to reduce single use medical items in, in healthcare facilities. Just a few housekeeping um, points before we get started with the content. So we have one and a half hours um, ahead of us. We're going to do a very short um, introduction. Um, and then we have two presentations. And at the end, we're going to have half an hour of question and answer session um, to answer any questions you might have. The webinar will be recorded. Um, it will be made available on replay on the Climate Action Accelerate accelerator website and on our youtube channel we do ask you to keep your um, audio and video off at all time unless you're given the floor um, please do write your questions in the in the q a session um, or raise your hand um, if you have any questions um, we also have um, translation available to french um, or any other language um, that is available. So you just have to go to the pane and then uh, go uh, show subtitles. Um, and then you will be able to see a live translation um, of the webinar. So just a short introduction. Who is the Climate Action Accelerator? We're a nonprofit organization based in Geneva. Our aim is to scale up climate action, notably within the international aid and health sector. Um, we're supporting our partner organizations towards a radical transformation of their practices and enabling them to halve their carbon emissions by 2030 and reducing other environmental impacts. Um, our partners benefit from close support of the Climate Action Accelerator, building their environmental roadmaps and action plans. And we also provide them with a network um, to exchange and to share good practices with their peer or publicly as part of this webinar. Um, we have almost 30 partners um, on board. Um, you see some of them um, on, on the screen. Um, with us to discuss the topic of reducing single-use medical items today are Neil Hint um, and Corentine Berthe. Neil has spent over 20 years uh, working within the NHS in, in various procurement and commercial roles. He's currently, he's currently leading the Anchors program for the NHS Greater Manchester and until very recently was also Chief Procurement Officer for NHS Cheshire and Merseyside. And Neil has been instrumental in implementing strategies to reduce environmental impacts in, in healthcare settings. And he will Neil will share um, some of the good practice examples um, within the NHS and also set the scene for, for the webinar today. And then we also have Corentine Berthe with us. Um, Corentine is the Supply Chain Sustainability Coordinator at Médecins Sans Frontières, so Doctor Without Borders. Corentine has extensive experience in procurement and supply chain and has been with MSF for the last um, 15, 15 years. She's currently focusing on developing and implementing strategies to reduce the environmental impact um, of MSF supply chain, including selecting more environmentally friendly items and improving practices to reduce consumption. And she will um, discuss some of the projects uh, that were implemented at MSF and share some of the learnings of these projects. So without any further ado, I'll hand over to Neil. And please, Neil, um, please feel free to share your screen and, and start your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invite. Um, I just want to give some some background um, on the topic around single use items, and then I'll explain a bit more about the work we've done in the NHS. So why is this important? Why is this one of the things we want to talk about? Um, I think hopefully we, we're all aware of some of the problems with with with, with plastic. The average 
the average um, waste is around 28 kilograms of plastic waste per person. We now know there are microplastics um, getting into the food um, and um, into the air. And there's evidence now that, you know, even in newborn, newborn babies and in lungs, microplastics are being identified. Um, so I think this is, I think there's now lots of evidence to show this is, you know, th this is becoming a serious issue. We also know that oil and gas extraction, um, which is needed for, for plastics, has high energy, energy use as well. So um, there are you know, a number of negative impacts on the environment. You can see here as well in the graph, um, the amount of plastics which, which have, been, have been made, the amount which is just used once, which is about 70%, how much is discarded after that single use, and the very small amount which is actually recycled and put back into use, which is estimated at only 1%. So you can see, you know, a lot of the plastic which is, is, being, is being made is going into landfill, is being incinerated, which are causing us other issues as well. So what are the problems with single use items in healthcare? Again, the amount of waste which is generated is very high. Um, hospitals generate about 13 kilograms of waste per bed per day, of which up to a quarter of that can also be hazardous waste as well. This brings us cost implications, um, a reliance on the supply chain. We saw this, we saw this during COVID, you know, when, when we can't get, there was a huge reliance on single use items and the supply chain soon failed which caused healthcare systems across the world huge issues. And um, you, you often see single-use products being, being marketed as being, as being safer, have less risk for infection, but that's not always, always the case. And you can see here on the graph, you know, 13, 13 kilograms of waste per day, of which a quarter is plastic. That's about, that's over a ton. Um, of plastic waste per bed um, for each each year. There's a nice nice picture here at the bottom of all the of all the items used in a standard cataract operation. It's estimated that there's over a single single over a hundred single use items used per cataract operation, and over four million of these operations are carried out annually across across Europe. So you can start to see the number of items that we are generating from the operations that we undertake. Do you want to talk a bit about the current usage and the priorities? Where do we think the focus should be? So this was um, an interesting piece of research that was done by, by No Harm Europe, where they looked at six categories um which which their research um showed accounted for 60 percent of the total pro total plastics being used there are gloves and you'll hear more about that in in the in, in the next session iv solution bags um non-woven fabrics such as gowns and drapes syringes incontinence and nappies and other linked products, and then um, intravenous systems as well. So this starts to give you um, some ideas on where we might want to focus, where we can make the biggest amount of impact uh, uh, in the clinical space. There's also quite a lot used um, outside of a, a, a a clinical setting as well. Um, there's a big list here of, of things that you may be using in your own organizations. The catering has had quite a lot of focus and lots of governments have implemented legislation to um, encourage people to move away from plastic cups and plastic in these categories. And that's been 
fairly successful when that has been done. And you can see now lots of alternatives, some examples here of paper cups, uh, the, the wooden knife forks and spoons, and um, wooden, wooden stirrers, for example. Um, and I think we've started to see these when we go to, you know, you know the high street coffee shops and, and takeaways as well, but also being implemented in hospitals and healthcare, healthcare settings as well. There are others in patient care as well. Uh, I think medicine pots is one which is quite interesting. I know a piece of work I was involved in looked at the use of the plastic, plastic medicine pots that were being used um, where the paper alternative would have been perfectly acceptable. And we've seen some, some changes in the way they have been used as well. Uh, the wipes, um, some now, um, some now reusable alternatives with the wipes um but again some some people find these not as easy to implement and easy to easy to use as a single use items but we are seeing um more items coming on the market and continents as well starting to see some alternatives coming with reusable items in this space as well some others that were picked up in the research probably not as not as big in usage the plastic bags sponges and also plastic toys quite a lot of um, use of those in some in some areas with, with with children but again all items where you might want to think about how how are we using these products and are there any alternatives so what are the key strategies for reduction how do we start to look at the numbers um, and find alternatives so i think there's three main areas really one is to look at our our supply chain um, what are the products we are buying do we really need them um, have our have our suppliers got alternative alternative products that we can that we can start to investigate we know um, again during during COVID, um, you know th there was a move from um, single use to reusable because there were organisations that were more that were more local that could specialise in the reusable items, especially in things like the gowns and the scrubs, for example. Starting to look at alternative materials. Are there other products we can use to make some of these items which are not plastic? Um, some interesting research I know around um, sit, uh, uh, around around aprons not being made from plastic, but being made from 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 products such as corn cornstarch. So I think um, starting to see more innovation in the marketplace. And then starting to think about recycling and waste waste management. If we are still using plastic or are using single use items, are there opportunities to actually recycle these items or even remanufacture them, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so, so some ideas that you may want to have a think about. There's also a question which probably should be at the forefront of our mind um, if we're working in, in purchasing is, do we need to buy the item at all? You know, is there really any medical or patient or healthcare benefits in the things that we are buying? And I've got an interesting example in the case studies where we found there were items, an item we were buying that wasn't really giving us any, 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 any benefit, and now that is being phased out. The waste hierarchy, I hope, is something people are fairly familiar with and again it's useful to have this in mind when we're looking at our buying strategies um you know and do we need as i said do we need these items is it something where we can rethink re redesign can we think about reductions and we're going to hear more examples of, of, of over over gloves where lots of work has been done is it something we could repair if, it, if it's not a single use item, but we're thinking of going out and buying something else. And then if we can't do any of that, we're starting to think about to the waste, 
is it something we can re recycle is it something we can we can use the parts for something else and really as a final option then it will go for disposal useful just to think about these these things though when we're looking at uh, so our category strategies we're also seeing quite a big move to circular e economy as well um and if, if this is a new concept to you this diagram here tries to il illustrate um what this what this really means as we know lots of energy and raw materials are often used in the things that we we are purchasing and um, there's energy and cost involved in the making of those items and the logistics as well to get them to the right places they are then when they are used as we've already talked about we need to look at what ha what happens next and you know a big push to recycling but i think more interesting now looking at re remanufacturing when it goes back to the organizations who made these items or other 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 companies who are coming into this market starting to think about then the items being cleaned reserviced and put back into the put back into the supply chain and also reuse as well is where we really need to be to be moving to where we can have a product and we can use it a number of times but i thought that was a nice nice diagram there which illustrates um, the thinking in this space remanufacturing which i've already spoken about seeing increase increased evidence and increase increased research to show some of the benefits which remanufacturing can bring and a nice diagram here looking at some uh, uh, cp items and um, you can see here the uh, co2 impact and the global warning impact of when items are made with a much smaller footprint when items are remanufactured um and you know there's a quote here that you, you know Evidence is now showing that circular use of, of catheters and um, the research is showing that it is safe, efficient and reliable. And also these items are often much cheaper to purchase as well. So there is a cost saving there as well. Do you want us to finish off really with some case studies and some examples? Um, these are all these are in the main all examples from the NHS, but these are proven examples. These 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 are projects which are underway and are being adopted across the NHS in in England. The gloves off campaign that you'll hear more about in the next session was really starting to starting to 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 question when gloves are being used. Um, I know there was a massive increase. Um, there was a massive increase in the use of gloves during COVID, and that has um, that has has actually kept. So lots of education, lots of work going on to um, get um, get um, people having patient contact. Just to think about, do you really need to be wearing gloves all the time? Um, which I think I know some of the case studies have seen a massive reduction in in, in the use of gloves by at least a third, if not more. Um, nice photograph at the bottom around, around theatre caps. Um, Single-use theatre caps were being used across, across theatres, but there's now been a move to reusable theatre caps and reusable gowns as well. Again, some good um, cost benefits there and some reductions in waste as well without any impact on patients and the the staff have been really staff have been really pleased with that as a project as well going to the top right um recycling in walking aids and other healthcare equipment um lots of examples of people keeping walking aids walking frames and other products at home or not knowing what to do with them when they have been used. So health, healthcare operations across England 
have set up recycling points where patients or the the families of patients can bring those items back and they come back into the uh, supply chain. Um, quite specialist, but the, the use of trocars, um, now equipment out there where you can reuse the uh, trocars where in the past they've been single use, cost saving, um, cost saving benefits, and the surgeons are also being very supportive of this. The surgeons have been very, very keen on using these items with some excellent outcomes for the patients as well. And the last one at the bottom is reusable sharps bins. These have been around now for some time, but seeing good, good, um, good uptake in the usage of the reusable sharps bins which avoids the single-use bins um, going into incineration. Do you want to touch on a bit more detail, um, some areas where there has been now quite a lot of research. Reusable isolation gowns is one, um, and you can see here, this is a case study that was done in uh, America. It was done quite some, some time ago, but you can see here, um, three million gowns um, they, that they're they now using, savings of over uh, a million pound. Um, 300 tonnes of waste has been diverted and they've actually seen, uh, originally they thought they would be using the gowns between 50 and 75 uses, but actually they're seeing usage a lot higher of that, 75 to 100 which again is giving additional, additional benefits. You can see there in the graph at the bottom, the difference um, in the water usage, the waste, use, the waste generated and the energy used as well. The difference between single use and the reusable, even when you're taking account of the impact of the laundry. And again, you can see here on the, on, on the graph on the right hand side, the difference between, you know, a single use item and reusable um, for the gowns. Lots of evidence now and lots of organisations actually, actually taking, taking this up. The, the couch rolls was the one I talked about where there was a piece of research done to look at, do couch rolls really serve any purpose? And it was identified that had very, very little impact on in infection, infection control. Um, the, be the beds are being, being wiped down in between patients anyway. Um, the savings are not huge, um, but average hospital was, uh, um, we've estimated about four and a half, um, four and a half thousand, thousand euros but a massive reduction um, in the use of paper, about, oh, about 55 miles of paper used in an average hospital in the, in the UK, um, equivalent to about over, over seven, uh, seven trees and a big reduction in waste as well. The remanufacturing, which I've already talked about, some figures here on the, the, the benefits of where um, this has been implemented. Um, we're now up to over, I think we're now up to about 40 hospitals across England who are re remanufacturing some of the items um, across the bottom there, the, yeah, the catheters and some en endoscopy items as well. And you can see there, there is an income um, generated from, from basically selling those items back to the uh, uh, to the suppliers and then a cost benefit bit as well when you buy those back and you can see um you know the the opportunity if the entire nhs was to adopt this which is being worked on the last example i want to give you before i hand over is around cannulation um there was a, um, there, it was common practice in certain hospitals in England when, where they would, they would automatically uh, give somebody a, a cannulation if they came into the 
into in, into the uh, uh, emergency ward. They started to to do to think about if that was really needed or not, um, and they saw uh, they saw a, a quarter reduction in general with a sit with an over six percent reduction in the emergency emergency departments. So that was a reduction of about 40 un unnecessary cannulations a day um, with an annual saving there you can see of, of 19,000 um, tonnes of CO2 and a cost saving of over £95,000, about, um, about 100, €140,000. Euros. So again, starting to think about changing some of the clinical practices to reduce um, to reduce the amount of plastic and single-use items which are being used. There's some further reading there if you wanted more information around any of those items I've talked about. And um, as Sonia said, you will get these, um, you'll, these slides and the presentation will be made available. That's it from me for the moment. Um, I'm going to hand back and then be more than happy to take any questions, any comments at the end of the session. Thanks a lot, Neil. Yeah, we indeed have already uh, two questions. We're going to take them at the at the end of the session after the presentation uh, from Corentin. Um, Corentin, could you kindly share your screen as well? Yeah. You see it? Yes, perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Um, today, I will um, I will uh, introduce the, the campaign uh, on the reduction of block consumption uh, that we piloted in MSF, as well as a reusable fabric mask, uh, again, that we piloted. And uh, then I will introduce the methodology that we are currently using to, um, to work on, on the reduction of uh, other single use, um, the reduction of uh, yeah, uh, other single use medical items. So the um, where with care campaign, that's the name that we that we gave uh, to it. Uh, it is actually based on the gloves of campaign that was mentioned earlier by uh, by Neil, um, and uh, we came to this idea of, of doing a campaign because we. We, we, we didn't find any eco-friendly alternatives uh, that, that was uh, meeting MSF requirements to, uh, to, to replace the examination gloves. And um, of course, we looked at uh, biodegradable compostable uh, options, but actually the, those ones are not suitable for, for MSF. We, we also saw in the literature that uh, there is a general tendency to overuse gloves in the healthcare sectors, which was also um, confirmed through a survey uh, that, that we did among our staff uh, in charge of uh, infection and prevention control, reported that they, they, they were wearing gloves in some situations where, where they were actually not, uh, not in direct contact with uh, blood or body fluids. So we we propose to uh, to run the, the campaign with um, with the main objective of uh, rationalize uh, the glove consumption, to improve compliance with standard precautions, and uh, and also to reduce the mental impact uh, of uh, of glove use. The second objective was also to reduce the risk of healthcare associated infections because uh, sometimes people tend to put gloves in place of washing instead of washing their hands, which uh, can lead to uh, cross contamination. So, um, but prior to, uh, to launching uh, a large campaign, we, we wanted to, to run a pilot uh, with the objectives to um, evaluate it and uh, ultimately propose a methodology that will, that will be then uh, replicable in other contexts. Um, voilà. And we uh, piloted this uh, campaign in uh, Lebanon. So of course, a campaign uh, is, is not just about putting posters on the wall, uh, but it is foremost uh, about understanding uh, practices and reason for, for overuse. And then based on the findings, tailoring the communication messages and uh, identifying action for improvement. 
So we, we, we targeted both medical and non-medical staff because we know that they are all uh, aware of uh, examination clause in our context. And, uh, and we also targeted the, um, the patient, uh, notably by the, the posters that we put uh, in the waiting rooms, uh, where we explained to them that yeah, healthcare workers don't always have to wear masks. Um, voilà. the, we also hired a campaign manager uh, with um, an inf infection and prevention control profile for nine months. We, in terms of uh, communication campaign, we introduced it. Uh, we introduced the, the campaign with the, with an official kickoff presentation when we, where we uh, introduced notions uh, related to uh, climate change, planetary health, uh, the importance of caring for the environment. Of course, we had posters, and we did uh, regular uh, trainings and refresher courses. Uh, we didn't invite anything. We simply tapped uh, into the learning resources uh, that we have in MSF related to uh, infection and, and prevention control. We insisted a lot on surface disinfection, medical equipment disinfection, cross-contamination prevention, um, etc. And um, and to, to 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 monitor to uh, we. To collect the data, uh, we had three methods. So we did uh, surveys. So we did the first surveys before the official launch of the campaign, and then, and then uh, a survey in the, the middle and at the end of the campaign. And it was to, to assess the knowledge uh, of the staff uh, related to, um, to the, the best practices regarding uh, hand hygiene and glove use. We also did the uh, on site audit again before the official launch of the campaign in the middle and towards the end. And, um, and it was actually the campaign manager going to the wards and making the observation of the participants' behavior. This was completed also by feedback uh, that, uh, that was provided by the, by the campaign manager. And we had also uh, a network of champions um, yeah, consisting in, uh, in both uh, medical and non-medical staff. Uh, that uh, that actually uh, yeah um, that, that that wanted to 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 participate and they they were uh, quite key in the gathering insight and, and suggestion to rationalize uh, the crop use. We uh, we defined two uh, indicators to uh, to monitor the the success of the campaign: uh, qualitative indicators, which was uh, yeah related to the improvement in the results of the surveys and, and audits. And a quantitative indicator, which which was the the, the glove consumption, care consultation in the in the participating uh, wards. So um, what we found is that actually uh, from the start, uh, the staff member um, were conscious about best practices regarding the hand uh, hand hygiene and, and glove use. Throughout the, the campaign, we uh, we also. Um, we, we could notice um, an improvement uh, by all the medical staff in adhering to the to the standard uh, precautions, and uh, and and yeah, in in parallel, we could see also that uh, people like hygienists stopped using examination gloves and instead started reusing again the heavy duty gloves. Um, voilà. uh, the bias to change that were identify our habits. Fear of getting infected and also mistrust, mistrust in, uh, in, in our uh, standard operating procedures. Yeah, people think that maybe they are not enough protected with, uh, with this um, with this SOPs. Um, it is super important to mention that the, the campaign manager uh, was instrumental in this uh, in this campaign in inducing behavior change because um, by the fact that, uh, that uh, people were observed um, induced uh, a change in their behavior. And then this, uh, the campaign manager was also uh, key in tailoring the, the communication messages and uh, identifying the, the training needs. So this overall uh, led to the reduction of 40% in the gloves use per patient consultation. And uh, so this was uh, the, uh, yeah over a period of uh, eight eight months. So if we uh, round up over uh, a twelve month period, we estimate the savings of uh, three thousand uh, Swiss francs and yeah three hundred sixty kilo of, uh, of left uh, waste produced.
Moving on now to the reusable fabric mask. Uh, so after an extensive uh, market review, uh, we identify this uh, this uh, this mask that is commercialized by Revolution Zero. Uh, it is washable up to forty times at sixty degree minimum. It uh, generates uh, less uh, less time waste. And uh, at the end of its life, the the, the mask can be uh, sewn together with others to yeah to to, to repurpose it in, for instance, a baby blanket. And if, uh, if there is no possibility to recycle it, uh, then uh, you just have simply to um, to to incinerate it as as any other single-use mask. In terms of price, uh, the, the reusable mask is the cheapest option if we consider strictly the price per use. Voila. So, um, because it has yeah, an impact on the practices, uh, it, yeah, it introduced uh, an additional uh, step uh, um, than with the usual uh, single-use mask. We wanted to, uh, to make a pilot. Uh, with uh, with two objectives, um, the first one was to compare the single use with the uh, reusable one in terms of under impact, but also in terms of comfort and suitability for the staff. And then we wanted also to assess if, uh, from a logistic standpoint, the reusable mask can work uh, in in our MSF settings, looking at aspects aspects such as uh, collection, washing, drying. And um, and tracking the number of washes. So we ran the pilot in uh, in Mozambique and in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, which involved a total of uh, 60, uh, 60 people. And we we had the three three methods to uh, to collect data. So we did a comparative life cycle assessment based on uh, assumptions valid for MSF. We also uh, did surveys, like for the gloves, we did a baseline, mid and end line uh, pilot survey. And uh, we had also focal points in the, um, in the project uh, to monitor uh, through observation, the logistical aspects. So the, 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 the results uh, of the comparative life cycle assessment so that the reusable mask outperforms um, the single-use one uh, on all of our impacts, except, of course, for the fresh water consumption, because obviously we need water to wash the mask. And, uh, and the, the reusable mask uh, generates only a third of the emissions compared uh, to the, to the single-use one. Um, the staff member overall, they expressed a, a slightly more positive experience with the reusable mask because they feel safer and need less to, uh, to adjust the mask when they when they wear it. On the logistical aspects, uh, it was interesting to uh, to uh, yeah to, to have uh, two two different uh, situations uh, where uh, in Kyrgyzstan people wanted to have their own mask personalized. While in uh, in Mozambique, it wasn't an issue for them to to use a mask that was worn worn before by by somebody else. Uh, but um, our conclusion is that actually uh, the mask should, should be personalized because uh, actually the experience of uh, multiple users in Mozambique led to uh, yeah yeah quite a high amount of, of loss of the mask because people feel less responsible for it. Um, we could also test the central washing, meaning the washing in our MSF facilities versus home washing. So both are possible. Uh, and we designed also SOPs for that. And uh, washing at home, meaning people can wash it either using a washing machine or uh, washing it manually. And uh, to track the number of washes, uh, we opted for a manual tracking system uh, where people had to put a bar onto the mask uh, every time uh, it was washed. Um, what was super important is that, that actually uh, we need to use a permanent marker because otherwise the ink will uh, fade over time. <laughs> And uh, what is key is also to make um, an official presentation uh, of the new product uh, so that people get a higher trust uh, in it. So where are we at at the moment and the challenges that we that we face uh, to, to scale up the implementation, that actually the tracking system uh, worked well in this uh, two projects, 
but we think that it might not be appropriate uh, uh, for some settings, especially in uh, in big settings where the things uh, will be washed uh, in a central central manner. Uh, because it adds actually extra work when putting a bar every time. So we are currently reflecting on, uh, on other options. Of course, we considered options like RFID and putting uh, maybe a QR code directly into uh, yeah, in, in, in the mask, but it requires uh, other, other technologies and cost, of course. So well, we are still there uh, reflecting and we also act, uh, we, we took a closer look at our uh, mask use indications. Since now we are outside uh, COVID, and uh, the, the thing is that uh, there are very few uh, indications for, for mask use uh, in it. Uh, basically, mask is indicated uh, when it has to be worn when, um, when we do um, highly aseptic uh, procedures, uh, and, and also when, uh, when, the, when people think that they are at risk of uh, getting, uh, getting infected. But that's that, that, that's it. So and uh, reusable masks are not uh, suitable for isolation setups because then actually the mask becomes a hazardous waste and has to be discarded uh, straight away. So nonetheless, we, we are convinced it's a great product and we, we want to implement it uh, because we think it makes uh, it makes it makes also yeah, our project more resilient in case of a future pandemic, for instance, where the supply chain uh, might be uh, again very much challenged. But yeah, that's um, that's where we are. Um, so, based on the experience of the, the mask and gloves, we actually wanted to, to broaden the scope of our efforts to all single-use medical items. And uh, that's why we decided to launch uh, another project uh, with the objective to reduce um, the impact of the of single use medical items and the packaging by orienting procurement towards more sustainable products and improving rational use. The challenge is that there are more than 1,000 products in our MSF catalogs that are flagged as uh, single use medical items. So it's uh, quite difficult to know what items are most problematic in terms of environmental impact and uh, the methodology such as the life cycle assessment uh, are not feasible because they're too expensive, too time consuming. So um, with this project, we want uh, to, uh, to develop a framework that will allow identifying key priority items in terms of uh, environmental impact um, uh, and, and mitigation efforts um, and we want also to propose uh, concrete mitigation measures. Concrete mitigation measures being uh, what we uh, mentioned, uh, I mean, what I presented earlier. So either finding alternative products or working on rationalizing the consumption. And also uh, we want to, to develop uh, technical specifications like phasing out PVC, phasing out um, yeah, chemicals of concern, to orient uh, procurement people and also people in terms of quality assurance when they select uh, new new products and, uh, and suppliers. So about the, um, the the analytical framework that we that we that we that we have been developing. So this this analytical framework translates uh, in an Excel file with many formulas uh, behind it, and is based on a life cycle approach. Uh, built around several assumptions that are valid for MSF. So in, um, in this uh, framework, all the life cycle stages are considered. I mean, manufacturing, uh, transport, storage, and end of life. We didn't consider the, the use phase because we, uh, we assume there is no additional uh, resources uh, yeah, uh, involved in, uh, during the use of the product. And we didn't consider the recycling uh, because the, the, there is no recycling involved for uh, single-use items so far. Uh, I mean, valid in, in MSF context. Um, then uh, the tool uh, enables the calculation of the impact of each item and its packaging based on the three uh, unknown indicators, which are climate change, meaning the CO2 emission generated during all life cycle stages. Uh, the human health, which is actually the adverse effect on health occurring during all life uh, cycle stages, and then the plastic pollution. 
So the micro and micro and macro plastic leak uh, when when an item uh, is a landfill, for instance. And then the priority the prioritization is based on a single score combining the three indicators that were allocated a, a weight of 80% for climate change plus human health and 20% for plastic pollution. And for the impact, uh, so we consider two levels, uh, the levels of a single item and the, I mean, the, the impact at a single item level and the impact at volume uh, level, meaning uh, when, when taking into account all the quantities uh, that MSF procured. So now that's the that's the, that's the the tool that you can see on the right side. It's uh, as I said an Excel file, um, and uh, so obviously we didn't put the four thousand uh, list of items that we have in our catalog, but we had first to uh, to, to to get to reduce list of uh, seventy five items. We decided to to, uh, to stop at uh, seventy five items. And um, and then uh, for the 75 uh, items, we uh, collected data from, from our suppliers on materials and weight uh, constituting the product and the packaging. And um, so we asked uh, for instance, uh, the, the weight in grams uh, of plastic, elastomer, cardboard, etc. We also asked them about the share in percentage of high impact plastic, such as PVC, Medium impact plastic, uh, such as uh, polyurethane, polyester, and uh, low impact plastic uh, like uh, PET, uh, polystyrene, etc. So now, uh, so to be honest, yeah, we have like nearly 50% of the manufacturers uh, who replied. Uh, for the rest, we had to, to make a guesstimate uh, based on our own expertise and also based on the the product data sheet uh, that, that we have. Um, what is also important to mention is that obviously MSF doesn't work with only one suppliers uh, for, 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 for products, but so we had to, 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 to go to, uh, to, to the suppliers uh, from, from, from which we buy the, the biggest quantity. And uh, so now uh, we have uh, we have the, the results, so we have the ranking of these items. Uh, we are we we want to focus actually on twenty, yeah, the top twenty items because we, based on the experience of the, the mask and gloves, we know how, well, what, what's the workload behind and the the, the work, uh, yeah, ahead of us to um, propose um, mitigation measures. So we, so voilà. So we this list is almost finalized, and and now we will uh, work on the on the mitigation measures. Uh, what is important to know is that this tool is actually intended to uh, to be shared uh, beyond MSF. So don't don't hesitate to to reach out to us if you are interested. Um, I didn't mention that uh, the, yeah the top twenty items in it. We can see already that we we have the the same key um, medical categories that uh, that Neil uh, mentioned um, in the in the previous session. So we had we have items related to uh, infection and prevention control. Uh, like gloves, masks, isolation gowns. We have also uh, lab items such as the Malaya test. And uh, we have also items for uh, um, IV treatments like uh, catheter, syringes, and, uh, and, and, and perfusion. Voilà. Thank you. Excellent. Um, thanks a lot. Um quarantine um, and Neil. Um, there's already a few questions in the in the question and answer um, chat. So please do feel free. There's a specific little icon for the Q&A session. So please do feel free to add your, your questions to the to the chat. Before we go, um, before we go to questions from the participants that are quite uh, technical on, on some te details, uh, maybe just before we get started on that, just a question from from my end. So you mentioned, uh, both of you mentioned uh, feedback from from staff. Um, so I was wondering, um, from your experience, which other internal stakeholders need to be really brought on board? Um, so which which departments, which staff in particular, do you need to get on board? Um, and maybe also, uh, you know, taking a, taking it together, but also any reactions from patients, be it 
positive or negative and how were these addressed? Um, whoever wants to go first. I can go first. So uh, for the for the stakeholders, of course, it's always starts it's, it's always start with the the, the, the top management. <laughs> so they, they 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 really have to be on board and and, and give like a clear clear um, clear direction. The uh, yeah um, where we want where we want to, to go and um, and uh, of course we had also to get on board. Uh, we have to get on board uh, people from the, the the quality assurance in MSF that are those uh, yeah um, actually validating the the product, the the, the alternatives, but also uh, looking at uh, uh, the, the, the technical specifications. We have uh, many reference in MSF that uh, medical reference that uh, who needs really also to uh, to to support this idea, um, and and. Hey, obviously, we need also to, to have uh, to have the healthcare workers uh, on board, <laughs> those that are going to to to, to use the, the, the items. Uh, and uh, for the question related to the patients, um, we actually we didn't uh, we we don't have any. Uh, that's not something that we uh, that we we didn't we didn't do any survey uh, so far. As I said, we considered them for the the, the campaign. Uh, I mean, we we informed them about uh, uh, yeah the the, the 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 use of love uh, by healthcare worker. When, yeah, and why they don't always they don't always uh, wear gloves, but um, we don't have this, this information. Thank you, Need, Do you want to add something? I think just to add on the. Stakeholder side. I mean, we we realised quite early on as one of our, our projects the infection prevention resources are key. You know, doing any initiative which is changing medical practice. You know, any anywhere there could be seen to be a risk of increasing increasing the risk of infection. It's really key to have those individuals involved. And I think I mean I think it, it's it's almost. Everybody really in the organisation, from you know, as 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 a continent said, you know, from the the executives at the board level, coming through to those involved in the purchasing, those involved in the management of the theatres and the wards, to the people who we who are using the products, I think there's quite a lot of effort which is needed on the comms around some of these projects and getting people bought in and making sure you're taking with them taking the people with them on the journey um where 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 it will not work as if just on a monday morning there is a change in product <laughs> that's where it will fail because people you know will be very skeptical and people tend to think some of this is being done just to save money and yes as we talked about with some of the projects there is a there is a cost saving there which is an which is an additional benefit, but I think when people understand it's around, you know, um, reducing our waste, reducing the impact on the environment, they're you know they're very keen and supportive in making it work. Um, so I mean, I think that's that that would be my big thing is to have a working group, you know, involving the right people, but appreciate it will take some time and effort and investment from, from those individuals. Great, thank you. Um, then uh, there's actually quite a lot of, uh, like I said, a few questions around uh, safety, hygiene, uh, infections. So starting with one, quarantine, can you share the prevalence of hospital acquired infections on stuff that are not wearing protective, protective clothing, especially gloves? And then how difficult or simple is it for both private and public healthcare providers to transition from single use to reusable or sustainable medical items? The first question was about the, the, the prevalence of, of hospital acquired infections. So did no. you track if there were basically more infections for people that were not wearing the, the gloves? No, it's, it, we, I cannot provide any figures on that. And, and I'm, I'm not even sure that we, that, that, um, so it was uh, we well, it was clearly clearly um, well we didn't want uh, we knew that we didn't 
we, we won't have the need to uh, the, the means sorry to uh, to monitor this indicator and i don't even know if we have this indicator in uh, in mss I, i'm not sure we, uh, we 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 monitor it um so and then maybe related to that another question is if there was a positive impact on the quality of hand hygiene uh, for example, staff washing the hands more regularly, and then um... yeah, I, I remember that we we had we 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 we, yeah, we had this uh, we uh, yes they, they actually they improve they improve on that I remember from the from the question in the in the I mean from the results of the audit I remember that people improved in washing their hands yeah. And then maybe related to that um, regarding the environmental impact then. You know, could there be an increased carbon footprint um, from increased hand washing uh, or increased use of hand sanitizers? You know, are, are there trade offs uh, in, in that respect? That's difficult to answer this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Neil. Is there anything from the, I don't from think the NHS any, that you? Yeah, could I, mean, I, I don't think there's. I've, I've not seen any any research on that, but I think I think I think I'm, anecdotally, yes, obviously there is an impact, but I think it's I think it's fairly minor. I mean, you know, the the cost and the impact of of washing your hands. Yes, there's a bit of energy in the heating of the hot water, and a very small amount of soap used or. A, very small amount of 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 our sanitizer used, but when you compare that with with the oils and the energy costs in making the gloves, um, I, I I haven't seen any research. I'm, I, there might be some out there, but I would imagine it's a very small amount. You know, the carbon footprint of the hand washing or the hand sanitization is is much smaller is much smaller than the than the use of gloves. Sounds like it would be a very good, very good PhD topic for for somebody if that hasn't already been done. Yeah, but but the intuition intuition is basically that the yeah. uh, yes, it is a, a higher impact on some other indicators, but overall uh, the balance should, should go towards uh, the the impact is lower when when the glove use is is basically reduced. Um, and then related to that, um, is the it's, it's also around uh, I think hazardous materials and, and infections. Is the detergent for washing reusable gowns safe for the environment? And and I would also th I would also think wastewater is, um, is 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 also part of the of the question. Yeah, and I think I think there are all the benefits. You know, as as, as as well on, on gloves, I can see I, I can see a question in there from Mr. Joshua, who I know from from the NHS and um, in in England. You know, there is there is evidence to show that actually there is less occupational health issues when people are not are not using gloves. Um, so I mean, I mean, we have seen we have seen uh, you know some, a reduction in occupational health issues and some and some other you know other hands and skin issues which i think is really positive as well so there are i know these that there is some evidence to say there is actually better you know it's better for the healthcare of the of the staff as well if they are not using and wearing gloves all the time um which is another benefit okay um then there are some questions regarding the mask, uh, reusable mask. So one is around why is it necessary to have a tracking system for mask use? So is this linked to medical necessity uh, or is it more of a data gate gathering? Maybe Quentin, if you could just uh, elaborate. No, because the, the, the mask is, uh, I mean, the, is, is watchable up to 40 times. The manufacturers actually like guarantee the mask is uh, still protecting, um, yeah. Uh, up to 40, 40 washes. That's why we need to uh, monitor this. Thank you. And then um, uh, one question on textile waste. Um, so we have a question around 
that uh, the person ha um, has an initiative in their healthcare facility in place that entails donating textile waste, uh, utilizing the clothing banks as a disposal point for textile waste, and are there any other options that one can consider to manage textile waste in a more sustainable manner? Are there, and in addition, are there any case studies of hospitals that are using reusable syringes? So one on textile waste and one on reusable syringes. I can probably take both of those. I'll, I'll start both of those. Syringes, no. <laughs> um, I, it's an area I've looked at in the past and it's just too difficult. And it might be one of those where we just have to agree that they are going to stay. Um, you know, they'll be plastic, they'll be single use, and there's not really any alternatives. I know there's some, you can use reusable syringes for the, uh, uh, at enteral feeds, which is a bit different um, with the, the the feeding tubes, for example. Um, so that's one. Uh, I can see we've got a hand up, so I'm quite ha happy to pause there. I think I provided admission to speak for the person that raised the hand. I hope I clicked on the right one. Oh, sorry, here. Um, Am I audible? Yes, now it works. Please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Now, the reason I'm asking about reusable uh, syringes, oh, excuse my manners. My name is Tepo Mukhad. I'm an environmental health practitioner by profession working for a public hospital. Now, we are generating a lot of syringes. I know in dentistry department, they do have these reusable syringes made of aluminum or metal, metallic stainless steel. So I, I wanted to find out if there are such initiatives out there that we can maybe take uh, a look at, take best practices from. Because we are generating a lot of syringes as medical waste. You look at the way we dispose syringes, we dispose it as a whole inside the shop's container. And that makes the shop's container to get full very quickly. So if you can have an alternative, then you might be able to reduce uh, our syringe or our plastic uh, waste uh, generation. That's the reason why I wanted to find out about the syringe. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm not aware of any real research in this space. I think my, my feeling is that the, um, the energy needed and the effort in needed in the decontamination of the syringes in between patients. And I'm definitely, I'm not an expert in the space and I don't know what the issues are um, on, the, on the number of times you could use a, a syringe as well without having to change the, the needles or you would have to change the needles in between every use. It's, a, it's an area I've never really looked into but it's, I think it's one we've always felt would be would be very difficult. I'd be really interested if anyone has done any research or has seen any evidence in this space, but it's not an area I've ever looked at and not really aware of any case studies in the NHS, I'm afraid. And, and in MSF, um, it's not something that... Um, of course, we discussed it and because some... Many of our colleagues in the past uh, worked with uh, reusable syringes, but uh, but uh, it's always the, the, the typical example that uh, the people uh, use to say well, we're not going backwards using uh, reusable syringes. I think there is a fear of uh, yeah of, of using because uh, and also a fear of uh, so first of all getting backward and also uh, maybe all the the. The, 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 the contamination uh, issue that could uh, be involved in uh, reusing such a, such a syringe. The only syringe that we reuse are the anterior ones, but uh, I'm, I'm sure that's not the one you are, you are thinking of. Thank you. Uh... And yes, if, if you do have, if you would like to share any further uh, information about uh, it, uh, Chepu, then please do, please do not hesitate to, 
to send us an email or, or put it in the chat. Uh, very, very happy to, to look into it. Um, we also have a couple of questions um, on LCAs. Um, so one question quite practically, um, how to manage the data collection and verification for LCAs, um, particularly in relation to manufacturing of, of single use devices. And then another one, um, very, uh, very good and interesting question. Um, given the limited time and efforts we have, how would you prioritize the choice between conducting LCAs on each individual medical supplies item versus having a more high level engagement with, with vendors, suppliers to work towards net zero? So if I understand the question correctly, you know, basically, do we, do we want to take an approach like per item and then engage in depth on that? Or do we want to basically uh, prioritize suppliers that have a, a decarbonization net zero plan in place and, and follow and follow their decarbonization plan. So we'll have two questions, one quite technical on the data collection and then one a bit broader on you know the, the, the question, do we want to go for an item approach or for, for a more supplier approach? Maybe the technical part, Corentin, uh, regarding as you were presenting the example on LCA, how did you handle the the data collection um, and the LCA process. It's a, yeah, right. It's, it, it's a life cycle approach that we use. Huh? It's not a proper LCA that we did. Huh? Uh, if we think about the the, 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 the tool that I presented uh, at the end, uh, so we basically we 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 ask the supplier to uh, to provide information about the the, the components uh, of all the different parts of the, the product that we buy from them. And, and we ask them to, uh, to, to provide the weight, uh, etc. Um, it was quite uh, it was quite uh, quite an intense work and uh, we, we had to, uh, to to go back several times to, uh, to the manufacturer. And again for 50% of them uh, they don't want to share this information uh, because they, they oppose the, the secrecy of the, yeah, the, 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 the recipe, the product. Um, so, so I think on the, I think it's, it's a good question. Do we focus on the supplier or do we focus on the product? I think is what we're what we're asking. And the NHS is is really doing both, which is probably which is probably not a helpful answer. But it's done. It's introduced something called the evergreen evergreen supplier assessment, and this is um, this is a self-assessment that the supplier does to help the NHS understand, you know, where the supplier is on their journey to become net zero, what work they're doing, what actions they've got in place. And we're also asking every supplier to submit a carbon reduction plan as well. So we can see that as an organization, they are working to becoming net zero. So that so the current work really has been done with the suppliers as opposed to the products. However, as part of the NHS supplier roadmap, there is a target. I think it's twenty twenty eight, where we're going to start to ask ask suppliers to also also publish the carbon footprints of their individual products, and we're just starting to think about. You know, the implications of that and how easy and how difficult it will be because that's what that's really what the buyers are really looking for now is you know the help the assistance the guidance so they can start to look at you know when they're looking to buy certain products they now have more information to see which you know if the price is fairly equal or there's a very small difference in price is there a big difference in the carbon footprint um, of those products, which might influence on that purchasing choice. So at the moment, the focus has been on the suppliers, um, but we are, seeing, we are now seeing a shift to start to ask suppliers to think about carbon footprints on the products. Um, be interesting to see how that, how that, how that, that happens and how easy it is for those suppliers in doing this. I think there's quite a lot of work needed on the guidance because I think at the moment, you know, not everyone does LCAs in the same way, different views on what, what data and what figures are included. 
you know, where does it start and end? So I think for us, to, for us to do that in the NHS and for it to be successful, there's going to be a lot of guidance and help and help and training which is needed. There is um, a comment um, in the question and answer chat uh, saying you you could do both, but also focus on procedures. Sometimes it's easier to have impact on waste generated from procedure rather than trying to tackle an individual item for all procedures. Um, and I would also add, um, at least that's how we also work with with our partners when work when looking at an at an item level. Um, we always um, push to go for 80-20 uh, rule. Uh, so which are the top items, analyze the top items and, and really focus on those and not looking at every every single item that, that is sourced. So it's really important to to look at the at the hotspots basically. Um, and then there was a question on the sharps container and the recycling of the disposed sharps. Um, traditionally, all our sharps are incinerated. Recycling sharps could be a game changer, but how do we overcome the risk of infection and cross-contamination? Um, um, I was just, I was just uh, including a link in the chat. Um, so I think just so just to I think that might be a misunderstanding of some some of the comments comments I made. So what we are doing in the NHS is recycling the sharps bins, the sharps containers, not the sharps items themselves. Um, I think going back to our early conversation over syringes, I'm not aware of anybody doing that. But the, the sharp bins, sharp containers now is fairly common practice. Um, in the NHS where where the boxes where the sharps items could go into are now reused a number of times and they are they are obviously cleaned and and the disinfected in between usage. Thanks for the clarification, Neil. Um, then we have a question on monitoring. What would be the monitoring system in place to see evolution in, in mission implementation? I think that refers mostly to Corentin's um, presentation. So maybe you could, yeah, put monitoring again on the monitoring system. Yeah, uh, we could. Uh, we could. Ref I mean, we could take the the same uh, the same indicator as, as the one that was used for for the the, the campaign. So looking at the uh, looking at the, the quantity uh, used uh, versus uh, the number of consultations, um, because that, that, that are figures that are easily accessible, and um, and yeah, looking at a qualitative indicator, I mean, like we did it uh, through surveys and audits, it's quite heavy. I'm not sure we can do it every time. Thank you. And then um, there is a question on um, recyclability of plastics. Uh, we know that most daily use plastic items are not recycled great, even if they are ad advertised to be. I was wondering if there has been any research on the feasibility of using actually recyclable plastic packaging for necessary single use medical items. Is it practical? Uh, and I think I would also add uh, add on to the question. So, how feasible is it at all to use a recyclable recycled plastic in 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 single use medical plastic items? So, I'm aware there's some legislation that might stop this in certain areas. I know, for example, um, not quite in the same not not plastic, but I know there is schemes now where you can recycle um, some of the metal um, equipment which is used in the theatre, such as the, you know, the, the scalpels and other items. And I think the legislation is that it cannot then be reused in a medical setting. So they tend to go into the car industry and into other industries. Um, I think it would be probably similar with plastics as well. It's a, it's a, I think the legislation is is actually changing, or it probably needs to change, and it is being is being 
looked at. I know there was some concern with re remanufactured items, for example, you know, when it's seen as clinical waste and when it isn't. So I know there's there's lots of people doing thinking about this. And I suspect we're probably starting to see some of the legislation change. Um, and I think that probably answers the next question as, as well. I think it would be different in, in every country, but you do, you know, you do need to think about how they you know, how there are actually rules and regulations around around some of this, and that's why some of this is is better done, you know, you know, what, you know, to the country level, with some of the national organisations, so they can work with work with these bodies in the background. And maybe it's also a, a nice segue to a question for Quentin because you know you're working obviously in quite different environments uh, than in Europe. You know you have operations, MSF has operations all all around the world in, in very different contexts. So uh, maybe you could elaborate a little bit more about some of the unique challenges you face as a humanitarian organization, and also you know uh, you're still ambitious and you know you put pilot projects in place so you know how do you overcome them and so when it comes to recycling uh, items uh, it's a bit difficult uh, in the context where we operate because we don't have any scheme that could uh, yeah that we can think of so anyway we we are on, on our own to dispose them of uh, properly and um, and then uh, I mentioned also during the presentation that um, we we well, we couldn't consider any options, uh, any alternatives for for gloves uh, that are uh, compostable or uh, biodegradable, uh, because um, because uh, those that are compostable require uh, industrial uh, composting facilities and we in MSF we don't have this kind of uh, composters and they are not even available in the, in the places where we, where we operate again we are on our own so we have to simply uh, incinerate them um, so that that uh, yeah so things that are maybe possible uh, here in Europe uh, yeah we we can simply not uh, in, yeah think of them uh, in, in in our in our settings um, yeah so it limits it limits sometimes the the, the, the possibility. Thank you. And then we have a comment regarding the previous question on recycled plastic. So someone, so Joshua says, I think there are issues with infection control with recycled plastics in in healthcare settings. Um, so we saw in your presentations um, both, you know, Neil presenting case some case studies, quarantine uh, the the pilot with a face mask, the current project. I would like to talk a little bit about scale up. Um, so what's you know what's your current sort of reading of the of where we stand? So are these sort of limited to some examples? Um, do we already see uh, a scale up? So, you know, for example, uh, I think about NHS, different entities, you know, really taking on um, these um, these pilots and, and really scaling it up. Um, or are these pilots for now? And and basically, what 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 would need to happen in order to in order to to scale up uh, these initiatives? So I think I think you're seeing um, a bigger uptake, especially across the you know the NHS. I mean, every every hospital, every trust, every organisation is encouraged has well is not encouraged, but has is has to have a green plan, um, and you know organisations now have to re report back on their progress against that plan and other targets set by NHS England. So we, I think, yeah, there are lots of case studies, but you're now seeing, you know, a more wider adoption of those of those case studies. It's probably fair to say that the adoption sometimes is slow. Um, it can take organisations quite a long time to take on board, you know, new ideas, new thinking, and that comes down to, like with all these things, you know, the question of of resources um, and the cost of the staffing cost of having to get the staff involved 
and the the priorities of the organization so i think we would all like to see you know lots more lots more progress being made but it's also probably fair to say if you look to where we were say th three four years ago a massive amount of work has been done and i hope that we will continue to see that speed of progress continue over the next next few years as well yeah, to comment on that, um, how, how how I see that in MSF, um, yeah, again, well, like, like Neil said, we would like to see way more way more of these uh, case studies uh, um, uh, carried out uh, elsewhere. Uh, we we are also working uh, with with our suppliers at uh, at at, uh, at quite a high level, uh, like Neil mentioned. Uh, like asking them about uh, what they do to um, to decarbonize the, the supply chain and etc. And and we are working through the through through through, through the project on uh, yeah we are working on on improving our technical specification. See how we can reduce maybe the the use of, of certain uh, plastic and components. But the thing is that as MSF we are we are. We are quite uh, quite small compared to uh, to other buyers, and we'll we'll have to uh, to join uh, forces with uh, with other other big players uh, in order to 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 to, to yeah to, to see these changes uh, happening. Thank you very much. Um, you have the opportunity to last. To ask last questions in the Q and A box, or by or by raising your hand, uh, I don't see any more open questions. So for now, uh, except if someone types quickly in a question, I have last one 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 last question to both of you. Um, what advice would you give to to any healthcare facility that that is just beginning the journey to to reducing single use plastics? Can you, oh, yeah, if someone asks you, what, what would your advice be? Um... Sensitize people. I mean, yeah, make them aware of, of the, 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 I mean, the impact um, on the environment that uh, that we generate through through providing care, um, and the why they need to care for the environment, and and maybe a quick win would be to start with the with the gloves, which is really really high on the on the, in, in terms of on the impacts. I think I would agree. I would. Be, I, my advice would be to to pick pick some easy projects which which have been proven somewhere else. Um, you know, generate a small team to implement those, and that will start to generate the interest, the enthusiasm, and hopefully the excitement as well when people see these projects being implemented, and the positive benefits coming out of it. You know, and that will then encourage people to come forward. With their own ideas and more projects and hopefully also be willing to take a lead on things as well i think where hospitals and have made the most amount of progress is when there's certain individuals who are very keen and passionate um, and you find quite a lot of these quite a lot of these projects are done by people doing it alongside a busy day job um, but you know we are seeing more investment now in specialist individuals and teams that can that can help out to make this happen so my advice would be to pick some easy things and just get them done and then shout about it extremely loudly <laughs> sounds great we have one last question in the chat and please just answer it super quickly because we're running out of time does plastic have a future in healthcare are we going to be able to reduce uh, uh, or get rid of plastics completely I think it will always have some future, um, just because of its versatility. You know, it's so, you know, of the cost, and it is very versatile, and it is used so extensively. But I think, as we've talked about with the case studies we've talked about and the examples, you know, I think we can see a big reduction in the amount of plastic used. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Corentin and Neil. Uh, I think we have a, a few uh, nice uh, lessons learned, I think, around the importance of, you know, choosing 
choosing uh, your top items, really uh, spending energy where the impact is is the strongest. Um, also, you know, use some quick wins, build on build on existing projects, and and basically start implementing. And then also the the importance of of leadership engagement and and really internal stakeholder engagement, engaging with staff and engaging with uh, with relevant departments um, in order to to make uh, these projects happen. Um, just this quick, um, oops, sorry. Um, just some uh, marketing from our end. Um, I just want to um, turn your attention to, to a publication that was recently uh, um, made public um, on the sectoral, uh, sectoral roadmap for the humanitarian sector, which contains an analysis of the emissions of the whole sector, as well as an operational playbook for organizations um, that are looking to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions in line with the Paris Agreement that is really based on the experience um, that we have with, with all the partners we accompanied in the sector, as well as an analysis of how systemic actors can show leadership and, and enable change. So this is available um, on our website, of course, and you will have the link in the, um, in the slide deck. Um, also, um, you will find on our website um, a whole um, inventory repository of solutions um, per different domains, uh, from procurement to um, transport, energy. Um, so all open source on our website. Um, please do uh, please do check it out. Um, following the webinar, we will also publish a new solution fact sheet on single-use medical items, where you can also find uh, some of the examples that were mentioned today, uh, some further reading um, and resources if you want to start um, in reducing single-use medical items in, in your organization. And then we're, we're right on time uh, ending our webinar. Um, thank you very much again to Neil and uh, Corentin for their, for their great presentation. Thank you very much for participants for the great questions. Um, please do get in touch. If you have any follow-up questions, do not hesitate to, to write to us. You see the, the email um, on the slide. And uh, you can also um, follow us on LinkedIn or subscribe to our newsletter. So thank you once again, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar and we'll, we'll communicate on the next topic as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.